Welcome back to Think Tech, and more specifically, welcome back to Asia in Review on Think Tech. I'm your host today, Jay Fidel. Our show today is called The Current Political Polarization in Taiwan. Uh, we're going to talk about the administration of Tsai Ing-wen, and there are many issues in discussion and in controversy uh, in Taiwan. If you want to ask a question, participate in discussion, you can tweet us at Think Tech HI or call us at 415-871-2474. Now, our guest for the show is a regular host for the show, Bill Sharp, the presenter of Asia in Review. Thank you so much for being here, Bill. Well, you're welcome. Well, you're welcome. It's, it's a pleasure to sit on this side of the table for a change. <laughs> you can relax today. Yeah. Bill out. spent a, a year as a, a, fellow, a fellow in the um, national... I, I had the Taiwan Fellowship, and I did my research at a, a place called the Institute of Taiwan History at mm -hmm. Academia Seneca. Mm -hmm. And Academia Seneca is a great place. It's very liberally financed by the central government. It's a, it's a huge complex. It looks like a major college campus. Thirty-five institutes wow. that cover just about every field of inquiry that you can think of. And uh, it, it very, very nice people, very supportive staff. It's a, it's a great place to be. It's a great national asset for Taiwan. Yeah, how great that you were there, and then you can come back and talk about it. Yeah, it was really great. I really appreciate their support. Uh, they're, they're supporting my research. Well, let's let's get a, the landscape on Taiwan for a minute. You know, Taiwan used to be, what do we say, m more of a protected ally of the United States than it is now. I mean, I don't think the United States is as, um, as um, protective. Mm. of Taiwan as it used to be. Uh, at the same time, uh, Taiwan used to be uh, more of a, um, a controversial uh, a controversial neighbor to China. Uh, but now 200,000 Taiwanese live in Shanghai. Did you know that? Uh, Quite a number of uh, Taiwanese live in Shanghai or, or uh, a place just outside of Shanghai called Kongshan. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that's uh, a lot of um, Taiwan businessmen have made that almost into a small Taiwan. Yeah. So, I mean, the relationship, although it's still kind of bittersweet, and you know that China would like to take over Taiwan at sure. some point, and, and there's all this, you know, saber rattling from time to time, um, and certainly the South China Sea is a part of that. Um, but, but the fact is that they're friendly in some ways, in business anyway, and uh, there's a certain exchange of people and ideas and products and intellectual property that really hasn't existed until uh, relatively recent years. And the question I want to put to you is, you know, China's seems to think that everybody around it belongs to China, or was once part of China, including the South China Sea. Was Taiwan uh, part of China, too? That, that, that's very interesting. You know, there's a scholar from Australia, uh, formerly an American, who took on Australian uh, citizenship. In fact, he was a guest on this show. And he has a very strong thesis that Taiwan was never part of China, and is very persuasive in his argument. And um, it, historically, um, Speaking, if you look at the relationship between Taiwan and China, it, Taiwan and China have never been all that close. Taiwan has always been sort of, oh, that's a headache island out there. We've got more problems to deal with here. And so it really was never, um, it, it never had a close relationship. Mao Zedong, this is something mainland scholars won't admit if, if they even know about it, because it's something that could have been expunged from textbooks and research materials and like that. Mao Zedong, I think it was in 1936, said, you know, after World War II, maybe we should let the Taiwanese go their own way. And it is true that Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong, if nothing else, they agreed on the fact that the people in Taiwan were too Japanese for them. So they were, <laughs> their, their sense of chinese was lost, <laughs> and if not lost, then heavily diluted. So, um, I, and I, you know, it's very interesting. I think the sense of Taiwanese identity is getting deeper and deeper and deeper as we speak. And this is a lesson the mainland should pay very close attention to, because the more it pushes on Taiwan, the more it tries to intimidate it, the stronger and deeper that sense of uh, Taiwanese identity becomes. I think sometimes that Xi Jinping doesn't quite understand Taiwan as well as he thinks he does. Um, after the Sunflower Movement, he was saying, oh, gosh, maybe we don't understand them, Taiwan so well. But prior to that, um, I'm not sure he still feels that way, but prior to that, he felt, well, I was the governor of Fujian province, the province directly across the Taiwan Strait from Taiwan, so, and I dealt with a lot of Taiwan businessmen, so I understand Taiwan. 
yeah, well, why were all those people protesting? <laughs> you know, maybe you don't understand them. I don't think that was they understand. The movement. Yeah, the Sunflower Movement. It was in 2014. It was it was a huge demonstration, and uh, and it was also followed up some by some other very big demonstrations too, um, and, and I'll call it an assault on the executive yuan, which is sort of like the uh, cabinet uh, cabinet office in Taiwan, and then there was a huge uh, demonstration. Um, at this place called the Gongliao Nuclear Plant. Nuclear power is a very sensitive issue in Taiwan. People in Taiwan play, pay extremely close attention to what's going on in Japan, and they know about uh, uh, Fukushima. Fukushima. And, and, and they don't want to see that happen in Taiwan. Yet at the same time, Taiwan needs energy. So they really put themselves into um, between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, you know, we should understand a little about it. I mean, you mentioned a minute ago that uh, it was too Japanese for Mao Zedong, um, and that was because the Japanese um, controlled the place during the war, mm -hmm. and they made everybody learn Japanese in the schools and all that, and so uh, the Taiwanese became very Japanese-like. Right. And they still today, some people in, uh, especially in the South, right, in Taiwan, right. Um, they speak Japanese, right? Now and they and their and their body English, their body language is Japanese, and it's very interesting how uh, you could make a distinction between a, a Chinese person um, by way of ancestry and all that by way of race in in uh, in mainland China is different in terms of culture uh, from the people in Taiwan. You know, this is very interesting. I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, I think, but um, but I'll take a chance. After you've been in Taiwan for a while, and if you've been to, to mainland China lots of times, like I have been, you can pick out who's Chinese and who's Taiwanese. Isn't that interesting? Because the Chinese are more aggressive, more assertive, one might even say a little pushy, um, and the Taiwanese are more reserved uh, and more laid back. Country style. Yeah, yeah, and I call it Jap I, I see it, I call it the reflection of Japanese culture, because there's a lot of Japanese ideas and culture that are still alive in Taiwan, and, and you can see it in the daily life of people. You can also see it in the way that the government is structured. Um, it's still there. there there's a um, you know just to go one step further. If you look at South Korea and you look at Taiwan, both were Japanese colonies. And you can still see a lot of, um, there's a lot of similarities between the two, and some of it is, is leftover Japanese influence, I believe. Mm -hmm. Very the, the, the government structure of um, South Korea and Taiwan, very similar. Uh, and both are very young democracies. Well, speaking of that, you know, after the war, and after Chiang Kai-shek made his crossing, um, the democracy, if you want to call it that, in Taiwan was pretty tumultuous. You've been studying that for years. Right. Well, I, I will say this, you know, during the Japanese period of colonialism, there were elections at the local level. Uh, and uh, this reflected some of the political beliefs going on in Japan at the time. And Japan's idea was to make Taiwan into a kind of a model colony that it could kind of show off and use as a lure to colonize countries in Southeast mm. Asia. Okay, uh, and then of course when Deng Kai-shek came there, you know, uh, he, 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 he had one problem after another, and so he imposed martial law. However, he still had local elections. Um, everything else was very tightly controlled, newspapers and all that, uh, but there were local elections. Of course, the only party running was his party. <laughs> Uh, although at a later time, they allowed people uh, with no party affiliation, independence to run. These independents be, later became organized and was called the Dong Wai Movement, which be, later became the Democratic Progressive Party, the ruling party of Taiwan today, Tsai Ing-wen's party. Um, is it fair to call it a democracy now? Oh, yeah, I think it, it definitely is. It's very, I, I think it's very democratic. Some people say a little too democratic in some ways. and. Um, I think that, um, it, you know, there's more to democracy than just elections. And Taiwan is really big on elections, and actually the way it carries out elections is, you know, for something for the U.S. to study, I think. There's no hanging chads and all that. And the results are known by 10.30, the night of the election. So that's pretty good. I mean, compared to what we've got going on here, we have 50 disparate systems. Mm -hmm. and somehow, and sometimes it seems like uh, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. 
But um, it, it, a democracy requires a lot of other things too. The building of, you know, like um, a civil organizations, the building of institutions. And Taiwan's a very young democracy, only since, you know, like 1989. And it's come a long way. It's come a long way. I, I mean, I for example, in the case of human rights, it wasn't always thus, but right now, the, uh, the Taiwanese people are into, uh, Taiwanese people are into human rights. Oh, they're very much into human rights. And um, if you consider LGBT issues to be a, a manifestation of human rights, then Taiwan is a, a definitely at the forefront because uh, same-sex marriage has just been effectively legalized in Taiwan. Um, and they're into the environment, too. They're very much into the environment, and especially the ruling party is very much into the environment. Uh, their colors are not green, <laughs> just as you know, a matter of happenstance. <laughs> but the thing is that, um, despite the democratization, there there is some um, uh, there's polarization in Taiwan. Now, this has been something I've been studying for the last year or so because it's greatly interested me. I first went to Taiwan in 1973 to study Chinese at uh, Taiwan um, Normal University. And at that time, those were the bad old days. It was definitely a dictatorship. People were freaked out about the police. And, uh, and there was a certain amount of oppression and brutality. Oh, yeah. Military police had their hands all over civilian society. And there was a particularly nefarious organization called the Taiwan Garrison Command, uh, which was if you got in trouble, especially for saying something about Taiwan independence or um, string up John Kai-shek or something like that, you got. Um, a visit in the middle of the night from the Taiwan Garrison Command and hustled off to um, uh, effectively what was a political prison. And actually, I think anyone's interested in Taiwan, they should go and see these two political prisons, which today are preserved as museums. In Taipei? One is in Taipei. It's called Jingmei. And uh, lots of leaders of the Democratic Progressive Party served time in that jail. And then there's another one on a small island off the southeast coast of Taiwan called Green Island. I've been to both of these places. They're, they're not Auschwitz, but they're not the Hilton either. <laughs> and, um, and I've known people that have spent time there and uh, in both prisons. And they paid their dues, big time. Uh, one person I interviewed, Shermin Da, he spent 25 years in jail. I, I really have to admire people like that for stand, spending such a significant portion of their life in jail. Um, when he could have been given parole, but under the con under conditions he wouldn't accept. But you know, this, this all drives to the question of national identity. Oh, How sure. do the Taiwanese, Taiwanese feel about themselves today? Right. Whether they feel separate from China, separate from Japan? Do they have their own identity? Are they proud? Are they, um, you know, um, do they see each, they see their country as a special place for them? And I guess the question uh, of the polarization that you mentioned would drive the other way, uh, such as in this country. We have, polarization. we have polarization. It doesn't help with national identity for sure. Uh, it doesn't uh, and I, and at the next part of our discussion, right after this break, uh, we should talk about exactly what polarization is and how it plays in the development of the national identity of Taiwan. Uh, that, that's good. I, I'd like to talk about that. We'll be right back. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive.
Hi, I'm Jay Fidel on Asia in Review, and our regular host is sitting just to my left, and that's Bill Sharp, <laughs> the presenter of Asia in Review many years ago, doing all these years and studying a lot about China and about Taiwan. So, you know, you mentioned, Bill, in the first part of the show that there was a polarization in Taiwan. It's very interesting because that, that doesn't pull the country together, obviously, by definition, that, that separates it. And uh, I'd like to know more from you about, you know, and you've talked to a lot of people, you've talked to a lot of VIPs, you've been gathering the gestalt of Taiwan for years and years. <laughs> That's an old Chinese word. Right, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd like to know, you know, what, what this really is, this polarization. I mean, uh, you mentioned me before that there's two kinds. One is historic division, which has roots in history, mm -hmm. such as we saw in the soft underbelly of Europe a few years ago. And then contemporary polarization, which is now, it's more political, it's more focused on issues that are happening right now and it's by definition temporary um, so you know which is it which is it now and how would you define and describe the polarization in Taiwan well yeah I think there's historic division which is probably going to be there for quite a long period of time there's huge differences between northern Taiwan and central uh, uh, well central Taiwan and southern Taiwan and there's also differences between eastern Taiwan and western Taiwan um, and uh, so that that's definitely there and there's ethnic tensions which have been um, uh, were exacerbated uh, in 1949 when you had all these mainlanders who had all the political and military power come to Taiwan and run it to the dismay of indigenous Taiwanese who wanted independence so um, lots of times people say well these ethnic tensions are going away and I think they are with younger people, but for older people, they're still there. And you can see those uh, when there's like elections, these older politicians that make political speeches, they play to these ethnic tensions. What, what ethnic divisions are Oh, there? well, here's a good one from the mayoral race. This is the mayoral race for Taipei. Taipei, the mayor, mayor's office of Taipei is the second most, political, uh, most important political position in Taiwan. And um, the person that was leading the charge for mayor, with the favorite, he was Taiwanese. He was running against the son of a prominent mainlander, uh, Lian Zhan, who was a um, former vice president. And a lot of older people were making speeches, well, you know, uh, that Mr. Ko wen his, his, his father was a running dog of the Japanese colonialists and that sort of thing. So this sort of thing, this sort of rhetoric comes up from time to time. Um, is this, is this um, plenary? I mean, is, it, is this the, the polarization, east, west, north, south, ge geographical or, or political or what have you? Is it in, ubiquitous throughout the population? It's or not is it just the VIPs? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. Let me talk a little bit more about this historic division. Okay, there's also the sense of what they're, the, what they're called the Da Han Jui. In other words, Chinese are number one and everybody else is sort of inf inferior. And I'm afraid that that still exists in Taiwan, and uh, much to the dismay of Taiwanese. And I think this is more prevalent with older people. Younger people, regardless of their, their Taiwanese or Chinese, they seem to get along a lot better. Is there a, a significant better. distinction between Taiwanese and Chinese? Aren't all the Taiwanese Chinese? No, because if you ask people the question, are you Chinese or Taiwanese? I am Taiwanese. Huh. And, and, and it's sort of politically incorrect these days to say I'm Chinese, because this is a question I ask this about everybody I met. Are you Chinese or are you Taiwanese? And uh, most people say Taiwanese rather assertively. And then people were sort of sitting on the fence, well, I'm, uh, I'm Taiwanese, but uh, you know, my mother and father came from China, <laughs> so I guess I'm a little bit of both. Hedging. <laughs> Hedging all the way. Hedging all the way. Taiwanese identity is on the upswing, is definitely on the upswing. Um, some of the big distinctions between, uh, you see, between the North and South is when the Nationalist Party came to Taiwan, they sort of focused and concentrated all government funds in the northern part of Taiwan. So the northern part of Taiwan tends to be a lot more developed, richer than southern Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Southern Taiwan is, uh, with the exception of Kaohsiung, which is a bastion of uh, heavy industry shipbuilding land. Is that new Taipei? No, no, it's a, it's a two-hour train yard right away, or about 220 miles. Um, very, and very southern Taiwan, southwestern corner of Taiwan. Uh, and that's basically farmland, okay? 
So you get these divisions between the developed part, the highly developed part of Taiwan and the less developed part of Taiwan. The, the corridor that goes from Taipei to Shinju is considered the wealthiest, most developed uh, section of Taiwan. It's sort of like uh, the train route in Japan from uh, Tokyo to Osaka. Um, uh, and then, you know, certain attitudes uh, are different. Uh, and uh, sort of um, the embrace of Japanese culture, which I believe is still prevalent, in, in, as I was saying, in the South. So you do have a lot of these, uh, and then you mix into this the Aborigines, okay? The Aborigines, they're sort of a divided community, too. You have the mountain Aborigines and the plain these Aborigines. These are the original Taiwanese. These are the original Taiwanese. These are the American Indians of Taiwan, mm. if you want to put it that mm -hmm. way. So you do have some historical divisions. And then um, you add on to some more, what you might call, more contemporary issues. And I think the greatest polarization started, a contemporary polarization started in 2000 when Chen Shui Bian was elected president because he was highly unpopular uh, with the Nationalist Party. He just kind of, kind of squeaked into office. And it was fearful that he would declare Taiwan independent, and which uh, went against the grain of a lot of what the Nationalist Party felt. Uh, and in actuality, he tr quite, tried quite hard to get along with China. <clears throat> but people in his party, uh, who does have a history of being pro-independence, were beginning to bolt the party and create their own party. So he had to, to bring him back in, or to stop that outflow, he had to back off from embracing Taiwan. Uh, and so, China, uh, China. So there then to be um, uh, acrimony at that point. And then as Taiwan became engulfed in globalization, you began to see inequality and wealth grow. Um, you, the issue I mentioned earlier of the party assets, what they call the Dongchan, this issue kept popping up and popping up and really forcing people so into the, the party wound up with right. the assets from before the, the from the time of the Japanese occupation right, right. Uh, rather than the country right the party got the assets not the country right when the Japanese left the, the Nationalist Party the Guomindang came in and scooped up all the Japanese assets and put those in their bank uh, okay um, and then I, as I mentioned earlier there's the issue of transitional justice so seeking you know um, to make things right from the past you know people who suffered injustices let's let's solve that issue and as I was saying similar to the situation that prevailed in South Africa um, but, but what I get here, what I get here is this, that this leader, uh, I wrote it down, uh, Chen Su Ban? Chen Shui Bian. Chen Shui Bian. Bian. Right. Um, in the year 2000, somehow took steps to begin the polarization that we now see unfolding. This is true. This is, well, I think there was polar, some polarization before that, but certainly with his step into office, it really uh, exacerbated it. And I mean, it goes to show you, I mean, we have the same kind of thing happening now in this country, where a leader can come in and somehow evoke polarization, somehow put people at opposite ends of issues and create controversy where there was no controversy before. And it sounds like what you're saying, tell me if it's not true, is that Chen Shui Ban, Chen Shui, Chen Shui Bian, Shui Bian uh -huh. I get it, um, actually fomented the same kind of uh, this unrest, this polarization that you're talking about. I, I think that's true, uh, at least to some degree. I mean, he was, frankly speaking, hated by some people in the opposition party. They really didn't want him to win. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people thought, well, you're from a poor farming family in the South, uh, and, um, you know, um, you're just sort of a country bumpkin, although he had been mayor of Taipei. And even people I know who were really um, strongly supportive of the opposite party, said he was a really good mayor. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, but, but when he became president, that was, um, th uh, th that's when I would say the acute polarization in Taiwan began. So has, has it gotten more serious <coughs> since he was in office? Well, when he left office, um, um, before, just before he left office, he was, uh, it was found that his the, the, the corruption, that he was involved in corruption, he and his family, and I think particularly his wife. And his wife um, suffered uh, some very serious damage, some physical, how should I say, damage, injuries, which put her in the wheelchair for the rest of her life. So I believe her attitude was, 
you owe me because of your politics, I'm in a wheelchair the rest of our life. And she began to take handouts and uh, expensive gifts from very fancy department stores mm. and things like that. Sounds like corruption. It, it is corruption. And I, I, I think it was her, I don't think it was so much him, but other people tell me, um, if you understood Taiwan society better, you would understand that he had to be involved. Mm -hmm. And other people said, I, I had an interview with a very leading um, a TV personality, new, a commentator named Sissy Chun, extremely bright woman, very, very bright. And she invited me to her very nice house one day. For, I had talked to her for about three hours, and she's saying, you have to understand, his wife is the daughter of a Taiwanese country doctor. And it's always the duty of the wife to collect the money. So she was just taking out for her mother. <laughs> <laughs> but Chen Shui Bian spent uh, how many years in jail after he left office? He was wrapped up on corruption. He spent, I can't remember, uh, how, just how, he was given a 20 year sentence. He didn't serve all that in jail. He became somewhat debilitated in jail, although he wrote seven books. And sometimes I don't understand how he could become so debilitated if he could write seven wrote books. Somebody for him. <laughs> um, and uh, now he's out on a medical parole. He lives in Kaohsiung. But he's not in office. No, he's not in office. And he is certainly, I think it's fair to say, not the person that he was. He's very charismatic. Yeah. He had great leadership, I have to say. And whatever everybody says about corruption, He's got charisma and he has leadership. You can have corruption and charisma at the same time. Uh, yeah, I suppose you could. I mean, uh, Mayor Daly of uh, Chicago it did, happens. right? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so right now we have a, a new president, a woman, uh, Tsai Ing Wen. Well, we had another president after Chen Shui bian was Ma Ying Zhou. Ma Ying Zhou was very friendly to the mainland. He wanted to be friendly with the mainland. Uh, he created lots of trade deals with the mainland. But lots of people would say that drained. Taiwan's economy, and that was responsible for the hollowing out of Taiwan economy and the loss of jobs. And this was a big cause of the Sunflower Movement, was, which was certainly, certainly, certainly added into uh, Taiwan's polarization, especially because it really impacted the opportunities of young people. Uh, Taiwan's economy is hurting, you know. Um, the salaries are very low. Teaching salaries are really low. I heard people uh, every day complain about those at Academia Sinica. And um, they the haven't been raises in a really long time, and the opportunities are somewhat deficient. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's too bad. And she inherits all this. She inherits all this, and she's really trying to turn the economy around. She's a, an econo she's a lawyer who is more like an economist mm -hmm. and an economics planner. She wants to build um, a new biomedical industry. She wants to build up Taiwan's uh, indigenous defense industry. Uh, she's got a $29 billion U.S. dollar, $29 billion U.S. dollar uh, incentive plan. Uh, I think she's doing a good job. She's taking on the really top. But, but what about the polarization? The polarization is still there, and it's going to take some time for it to go away. It's going to take some time. Is she working at that? I mean, is she well, having a salutary effect on that? Her idea of solving the polarization, I tried to get an interview with her one time, but I was un unable to do so. But I believe her approach to polarization is you've got to create the Taiwan consensus. You've got to bring everybody together. Always. And, and you know, I read her book, and uh, she talks a lot about this. Um, and she's very methodical. Um, uh, it's interesting, she got elected to office. You know, we have other women in Asia who've gotten elected to office, but it's usually been because of the father preceded them. Uh, the previous president of Korea, Park Kyung-hye, her father mm -hmm. was president, okay? Uh, if you look at uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, her father was the founder mm -hmm. of Burma, Myanmar. But uh, Tsai Wen was on her own merits. Tsai Ing Wen was on her own merits. So you, you really got to give her credit for that. Indira Gandhi of India, she got there because of her family. Um, um, oh, I can't think of her name. Oh, um, Cory Aquino, she got there sure, because of example, her husband. Yeah. So where is it going to go, Bill? I mean, we have a, a hollowed out economy, you called it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have low wages. We don't have enough money to, to uh, maintain the pension system. Um, and we have China trying to box us out of the international space at every chance he gets. Every chance. But the good news is that since it's been in office, the stock market has gone up. 
I'll make a note of that. Yeah, so she's, uh, she's doing some things right. Okay, we have to follow it, Bill. You have to follow it uh, on this show and in every way and write about it and all that so we can see the future unfolding because we care. The United States cares about Taiwan. Maybe not the same way as, you know, in the, in the days after World War II um, or in the days of the early days of Mao Zedong, um, but we still care. We want them to do well, and that's one of the reasons you're there, I know. So I'm, I'm going to offer you this opportunity, Bill, to say goodbye to, you know, close with our, with our uh, okay. audience. But I'd like you to do it in Mandarin, okay? Would you mind? <laughs> this is Bill Sharp. He does speak Mandarin. Go ahead. Uh, I wasn't kidding. Sai Jen. Sai Jen. Okay. <laughs>